Okay, welcome to the LCL panel about linguists and entrepreneurship. Uh, we have three panelists with us today who have each started their own businesses. And I think I will introduce them in some random order. Stephanie Rosenbaum founded TechEd and she divides her time between Michigan and Palo Alto. And I know she's gonna talk about lots of things related to this, but the reason she's here is she got her bachelor's degree at Berkeley in philosophy of language. Yay, go bears. <laughs> Actually, actually, that was it's even it's even more complicated because that was the master's and the bachelor's was um, was in something called unified science in the honors college, at University of Michigan. So there you go. It's it's it it's it's a dual kind of uh, education kind of right from the get go. Got it. OK, let me introduce everybody and then I'm going to come back and let Stephanie introduce herself more mm -hmm. thoroughly. And so Nina founded a company called Pixel Loom to help develop websites for others. And last but not least, we have Samantha uh, from Memra. And this is her new company that started about five years ago. Is that right? Something like that. And where she has taken her degree in linguistics and turned it to help industry with qual how to process and understand, analyze qualitative results to surveys. And I'm sure you're branching out and doing other new things. And so we can talk more about all the ways you've grown. So thank you so much for all of you for showing up. And Stephanie, tell us, because I think you've been in business longer than most of us. Well, I, Nina, Nina's, Nina's a pretty close runner up. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was tickled to see, but... Um, Okay, so kind of how did I get into this? Uh, I got into this because Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, wanted to find out whether, in, this is now in the 1950s, wanted to find out whether anybody who wasn't a PhD electrical engineer could understand these new things called computers. So, you know, this, is, this takes you back to the dinosaur age, but that's what it was. And she got the National Science Foundation to set up a course for teenagers uh, where at Columbia, where Columbia uh, electrical engineering professors lectured and IBM donated time on what was then a $1,000 an hour computer at Watson Labs and it used a vacuum tubes. <laughs> so this is, this, is, this is really the dark ages. But what it did was get me started in what, what was possible in computing early. And it showed me something very early that took a lot of other people a lot longer to see which is that they were people that were working in this brand new field were brilliant people. They were some of the nicest people in the world and they were some of the worst people, worst communicators in the world. They, <laughs> a language was a computer language. A language didn't have anything to do with people. So from that experience, I, started going back and forth between the communication world and the technical world. So when I worked my way through college, some of it, some of it was in biochemistry labs and some of it was working as a content developer. <laughs> so when I started my company, it was basically as, as translation between engineers and it was ha I started the company just as computing was starting to make its way into the business world. And uh, these people needed translators from, from engineering East into a uh, real qualitative language. So that was, that was a place for it. And that's, that's what I did. Cool. What is, I don't know, is that the right, kind, right level of star? I think that's a great place to start. Thank you, Thank Nina. You. Well, I have the feeling Stephanie and I are sort of the same generation. I uh, took my first computer class my freshman year at Wellesley College. It was taught by professors from MIT who came out on the Wellesley MIT bus. And our cards, we had to punch cards and they got put on the Wellesley MIT bus and run into MIT to be run. And <laughs> And then you got them back, you know, and and you had a, a syntax error and it had to wait another two days. 
But there was a terrible time when some of the, the uh, card boxes went to the back of the bus and weren't found for a couple of days. And so it was just a really different way to learn programming than anything we might do now. Um, Absolutely. But I also was at Michigan um, for my, P my master's in PhD in linguistics. Um, and then I worked at Bell Labs in New Jersey doing work that really was sort of related to linguistics. It was all the same sort of stuff Stephanie was talking about. We were working on trying to provide feedback to technical people about their writing with computers. And that went on until the vestiture came and that all got clobbered. And uh, then I worked there for another seven years as a basically as a computer high level computer programmer. So when my husband just got a job at UCI out here in, in Irvine and Bell Labs was falling apart, um, it was just a really depressing place to live. I mean, to work because everyone was getting fired, well, laid off. I mean, they were just closing department after department. So I wanted to leave even though I still had a job. And we came out here and that was in 94. We were using the internet on uh, Mosaic, uh, but nobody was. And a few years later in 99, some friends of mine and I started a company to do websites and which was pretty, pretty radical at the time. <laughs> and I'm still doing it. They've all gone by the wayside. They've all retired, but I'm sort of stuck with this hosting company that I run. And uh, I can't say I'm making a lot of money at it at these days, but I still have clients that I feel like I have to keep going for. Sure. Does yes. that resonate? That's exactly, it really does. Yes. And so what years were you in Michigan? Um, before you, I think, because it was my undergraduate. So I was there in the early 60s. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was there from 70 to 76. Yeah. And so by then I was out in California. Samantha, tell um, us about your, your, your route from linguistics into private industry. Sure. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Samantha, and I um, am the CEO and founder of Memory Language Services, as Nancy has sort of already stated. Um, I've been doing this actually for about three and a half years. <clears throat> um, and I always can remember because I have a three and a half year old son, and it sort of like coincides with his birth, um, you know, the founding <laughs> of the company. So I can, that's sort of like how I keep track <laughs> of how many years it's been. Okay. Um, but uh, so I, and actually um, having my son is sort of part of the reason why I was motivated to start uh, my own company. I was on the uh, PhD track and I was about to finish my, my master's um, and I decided to stop after the master's, um, you know, when I had him, but also because, you know, I had this idea of applying um, some of the, you know, sociolinguistic research techniques that were a part of my program in sort of a novel way in industry. Um, and so, you know, four years ago, I feel like the company culture boom was sort of starting, you know, where all of a sudden that phrase and people were talking about, you know, company culture and how important it is that sort of started. It was right, you know, when I was thinking about starting this business. And so, um, it, you know, coincided well that way where I thought, you know, linguists study culture through language all the time. And they have been for decades, right? Or sociolinguists do. Um, so why can't a sociolinguist then also study company culture through employee language use? Um, and so at first I sort of looked around to see if someone was already doing this because it didn't occur, you know, I didn't start out thinking, um, you know, I really want to be an entrepreneur. I just had this idea and then I was like, oh, somebody must be doing this. Um, and I couldn't quite find the exact right fit. There are, there are of course, lots of companies, you know, that I analyze survey results, but um, not necessarily using a sociolinguistic framework, um, right? Using other types of language frameworks. Um, and so then I decided, well, uh, maybe I should do it. And then of course I had my son and I was like, this is the perfect time. 
um, I can start my business sort of slowly and let it grow organically as like my child grows and be home part time with him. And so that's sort of why I started it and how I started it. Um, and now four years later, it's, um, yeah, sort of just a rock and roll in business. You know, I have clients and um, it grows every year and it's just a really, it's been a really exciting adventure. And of course, though, it has changed. Some of the things that I'm doing have changed, you know, from what you originally think when you set out, right? Um, because your that your idea then mixes with client needs. Um, and as clients bring needs to your attention, you're like, hmm, is that something a linguist can do? And then of course you wanna say, yes, it is. Um, if just one, because you're a business owner, but two, because you know, as a linguist, it's important to be flexible in thinking like, how can I bring my skills to this challenge that a client has? And so that's been part of how my business has evolved over the last four years. Excellent. So what, what do we want to take up next? Uh, Stephanie, you want to tell us a little bit about um, some of the issues? Well, how, how has your business changed, I guess? Okay, yes, absolutely. It's been a big shift, right? Expand. Yes, it's, it's made a huge shift. Because yeah. when I started the company, we were basically, we were right, when I started the company, we were writing help systems for mainframes. Okay. Right. And then we started writing you know, help systems and user guides and instruction, doing instructional design for mini computers and microcomputers when they came out. But it got increasingly, increasingly frustrating in that it's, you can only achieve, no matter how good your help system is, no matter how good your, your instructional design is, you can only do so much trying to explain a, a user hostile system. <laughs> because yeah. what you want to start doing is, is, is changing the product or system so that it's not so, so to lower the bar for the for the you know target audience and the user community. So we've realized that and started uh, basically we sent people to conferences, we sent people back to school. That was actually when my philosophy of language academic background, which I thought was never going to be of any use to me whatsoever. In, in the business world or real life, I was studying it because I loved it. That's when I began to realize that, that, that the, all the, the boundary, the edge cases and the boundary things and the fuzzy sets and all the, the Wittgenstein that I'd studied, you know, had, an, had a, a place in, in the world of trying to organize information and get user interfaces to be better. So we segued from doing pretty much 100% of content design and development with you know, the attempt, uh, the, the, the conversations with the developers to say, you know, if you would make, if you would change this this way, it would be a lot, you know, people would find it easier and it would only take a sentence to tell people how to use it instead of a page and a half. <laughs> and we certainly did that. <laughs> and and, and one, of, one of the funniest things in fact we did was writing a user guide for an early piece of accounting software uh, we realized they must have had two or three different development teams on it who didn't talk to each other because about half the commands you had to enter a carriage return for them to take the effect, take effect, and the other half just took effect the second the string went in. And when we pointed this out, they wouldn't believe it. <laughs> the company, they finally, we sat them down and said, "Look," and they kind of went, "Oh my god." <laughs> Well, at least they recognized that it was an issue if you had yes. a, not a common syntax for your command yes. line yes, uh, yes, commands, exactly. right? Exactly. But anyhow, so what we started doing was uh, more and more uh, interaction design, more and more uh, information architecture, which of course we were doing all along, but more interaction design and a great deal more user research because we realized that it wasn't enough even for us to say, no, we know how to make this better uh, because we were usually not, didn't usually have the same profile, you know, the socio part as the target audience. And what we needed to do was get real data about the target audience. So from having a practice that was like 90% content design and development, we now have a practice that's probably 75% uh, user research about you know, and the rest is split between uh, interaction design and still content design and development. So it's, it's, it's but we, we, it puts us much more 
central to what's uh, yes. Now we now we have the cat in the picture. That's all right. Which is much more central to <laughs> what. There we go. We don't have a small child. But we have yes. we have Will, We have Willow who needs to be part of every conversation. Of course. So I know you have just uh, thrown out a bunch of terms that we've introduced, but it, uh, I'm going to wait for the audience to ask you to unpack them again. And I'm thinking of things like interaction design, information architecture, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, because that's we that's new words. They've only heard them for the last uh, week and a half a few times. So okay. we, and user okay. research. I gave the user research talk this morning, but I'm sure Excellent. there's more to say there. Okay, so what would you like? Do you want well, us? Well, I'm going to let the audience uh, demand something more from us. I'll I'll let Nina take a, a turn, and then we'll come back. Okay. So Nina, how how did you organize your business to start with? You said you had collaborators that you were working with, but now they've fallen to the wayside. So it's all you. So talk about that kind of stuff or anything that was inspired by what Stephanie said. Well, we started with. Uh, three partners um, and we would never have formed the company except for one of them who said she would do sales and um, convinced me and a friend of mine who was a graphic designer that we could do build websites. Well, she never sold any websites, unfortunately. Oh. Um, although she's a remarkable person, we would get in elevators and she would introduce herself to everyone in the elevator, which I just wow. found amazing because I'm yeah. really shy. Um, and so she eventually left and I got another partner and then the graphic designer left and we got another partner and eventually the, other, the last two basically retired. Um, we started out as just a company, and then after a couple of years, we we managed to get, we switched to being an LLC, um, so that we could protect our uh, personal assets from any kind of uh, suit or whatever. Because we live in a litigious society. Now, fortunately, we've, we also had a lot of insurance for a very long time. I've dropped it all now, but we used to carry a million dollars of insurance. Yeah. Uh, so if somebody's website stopped taking money for their product, you know, and they sued us, uh, we would have insurance. Um, the, the website business changed so much over time. I'm sure. I mean, I mean, HTML changed everything. And when we started, it was hard to do websites, and you had to have you had to have a Mac, and you had to have a PC, you had to have all the different browsers, and they all looked different, and you had to code for all of that. And now none of that matters, and there's so many high-level programs. It's a lot. I mean, mostly if we do websites now, we do WordPress. Um, so it's just, it's a very different system. But I guess what, as a linguist, what I found was that computer languages are just another language. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I learned, as I said, I took my first programming class as a freshman and I kept taking programming at Michigan when I was getting my PhD in linguistics. And at Bell Labs, I ended up being a programmer. So that was just, it, it just fell out from the fact that what I liked about linguistics was grammar. I mean, I, I went to college thinking I was going to major in French because I loved taking French in high school. And after my first term in, in college, it turned into literature. <laughs> How dare they? <laughs> <laughs> just appalled because I never yeah. or cared about. I wanted grammar forever. So I think a lot of linguists who may not know that they could do programming probably should think about it. So you recommend learning to program? 
I do. I, I mean, it was so much easier when Stephanie and I were coming along. I mean, women were programmers. There, were, there was no, I, but I understand now that, you know, it's women are a very low percentage of, of people in computer science now. But when we were there, it was just normal. I mean, there were we were there were a lot more men than women, but it, but it, it didn't matter. I mean, you could at this point they at then they needed they needed these skills so desperately. The field needed these skills so desperately that you know you could be you could have uh, you know stripes in a tail, and it wouldn't matter if you could program. <laughs> Willow could program. Yes, yes, Willow could program. Right, right. Stripes in a tail. Yes. <laughs> I almost said that, but they decided this was too cutesy, and I wouldn't say. That. <laughs> so Samantha, but, yeah, do you have more to say, Stephanie? Did I interrupt you? Um, well, it's, uh, just just the you were talking. About, Nina was talking about evolution size wise, and I've had sort of a similar thing in that we started with with basically with just me uh -huh. and then a couple of contractors, and we grew and we grew and we grew. And at our largest, we had forty two employees wow. and that was just too much that was too many layers of management that was you know it was it was inefficient and it wasn't much fun and so we started letting attrition take hold and now we're we're much we're a much we're much smaller and doing stuff that's fun for me later in my career and not not management which is less fun for me right okay but so, I didn't realize you'd been up to 42 that's oh awesome. my god it was I don't want to say it was dreadful, but it was a challenge. Yes. I, I would say most of the time, most of our, our huge period, we were some, we'd been someplace between 10 and 20. Yeah, and I think that's, what, were, that's what I would have guessed. And so tell me, Alina, what were you saying? These were real employees, not contractors. They were, they were absolutely. And on the neck. I mean, we had an employee for one year and, and I, it was just so much paperwork. Yeah, I mean, now we've, we've actually segued so that now we're much more heavily contractors because it makes it a little easier to, to flex. And, and because we've had built up relationships when I mean, you say contractors and, and, the, and people immediately go, oh, temporary, you don't know them, you just grab them from somewhere. No, some of our contractors have been with us for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Actually, some of our contractors have been with us for longer than that. So it's it's... You know, they're 1099 folks because we don't necessarily need their particular skill for every project, but the, it's a, a very, it's a, a lengthy and robust relationship. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Samantha, have you uh, tackled the employee or contractor challenge yet? Um, no, I mean, I do have... Um... I do work with contractors. I work with a developer and I work with a graphic designer. Um, so I, I do have that, but in terms of like hiring uh, contractors to help do the analytical work that I'm doing, the linguistic work, I haven't gotten there yet, but it sounds complicated. <laughs> it can be. Yeah. Yeah. But a good kind of complicated, right? Because growth is what you hope for. So. And well, you know, okay. and indeed it's expensive. I mean, you have to have the, I, I think actually I'm still carrying that million dollar insurance because liability, because some of our clients require it. Mm -hmm. So there you are. I mean, yeah, insurance is one of our biggest expenses, actually. Yeah, so, I mean, next heavy. to people, next to actually paying for people to do things. Right. So the labor costs are first and then insurance is another yeah. big one. Yeah. Yep. But, and you do have physical offices? You know, we gave them up during the pandemic and I think yeah. everybody's happier. So okay. we've had physical, we've had, we've had physical offices for, for 50 years. And in the middle of the pandemic, we finally said, this is ridiculous. They're expensive. Nobody's, nobody's going there. We're and working just it. fine. We right. don't need it. We're working just fine remotely. We're scattered around the country anyway. So, um, so we gave it up. And unfortunately, some of the stuff is now still in my library. Because we had an awful lot of stuff, but yes. because we, we've only get you know it's only been six or eight months since we hit the bullet and gave it gotcha. up. But I think we're all happier actually. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, somebody asks Samantha in the chat, uh, "What's your uh, corporate structure? Are you a sole proprietorship, or did you pick a, another?" I'm an LLC as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. So um, 
I think probably probably similar to what Nina is now, not what she started out with, if I'm understanding correctly. But mm -hmm. um, yep, and that's this for the same reasons too, just the right kind of protections um, for your personal assets. Um, and you know, I think an LLC. A lot of small businesses choose to be an LLC because it's um, fairly simple, and um, yeah, the protections are all there. But it all depends on it depends on a lot of different factors what you choose. So I'm seeing a question. Yeah, yeah. I st I um, stayed a sole proprietorship for quite a while, and then mm -hmm. shifted all the other direction, and we're we're a C corporation. Mm -hmm. So well, in California, if you make less than two hundred fifty thousand a year, an LLC is cheaper than a as S Corp and we never made that much. So it was, wasn't a, wasn't hard for us to choose. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, and I, th I think it's really common for businesses to switch too. You know, you might st you start out as something and then as, as you grow and as your needs change, you can um, switch. It's not always easy to switch everything, but um, usually worth it if you have to, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> So how do people find out about your work, anybody? And how do they choose you over whoever else might be available? Um, well, I can start with this one. Um, okay. So I found that, well, okay. So the, the problem that I was, that Memra solves um, is essentially workplace communication analytics. And I put it under the umbrella of people analytics because that's a term that businesses are using a lot. Um, right, so they they conduct all these people analytics on their workforce, um, and usually the type of data that they're using is demographic data and performance data. Um, so you know we have x enough x number of women, um, you know of you know whatever race, and this is their performance data, and they sort of collect this their these people analytic data um, for you know whatever their, um, you know, human resources purposes are, right, for hiring, for, um, yeah, performance uh, assessment and things like that. Um, so what my company proposes is that actually language should be another data point um, in that under that people analytics umbrella. So if you really want to know how your workplace is, how your teams are working together and how your um, in, employees are performing, you should be collecting language data um, from them as well, organic language data. Um, and so this is usually when I, uh, a new concept for uh, businesses, um, because even though a lot of businesses have a lot of language data, especially since the pandemic, when all of their meetings have been recorded, right? But even before the pandemic, um, you know, with just in general online, um, online chat services, um, internal, like internal chat systems and things like that, um, they have a lot of, usually have a lot of language data sitting there, right, from surveys, interviews, things like that, um, but they've never considered, you know, using that as a part of their, you know, workforce analysis, um, and part of the reason for that is because they don't have a linguist on their team, right? What? Because it's <laughs> I can't believe that. Well, you know, it's so hard to analyze um, random language sentences if you're not trained to do that, right? How can you take your, you know, um, just even someone with a general communications degree and say like, okay, here's a thousand sentences from 500 employees. Tell me something about how this team is working together from this data. Um, that's a big task, but a linguist can do that as long as you set up the right research framework, you know, and you're sort of, um, you know, going by a system that's been established, right? So um, anyways, the way that I get clients is that I have to explain all this to them first, right? Because they don't know, they've never considered it. They don't even know necessarily that their people analytics are lacking because I'm sort of the one telling them, hey, you have, you have a problem and I'm going to tell you about your problem and then I'll solve it for you. <laughs> um, so that's a slow way to grow um, because the problem isn't necessarily obvious to them. But once they see the potential um, of, you know, all that data that's there and then they realize, um, oh my gosh, if we started analyzing language data, we wouldn't have to survey our employees every six months or we wouldn't have to, um, you know, like, bug them um, and doing like, you know, check-ins as much, right? We, we're just collecting the data that's happening every day in the workplace um, and, and using that as our metric um, in a systematic way. 
And so usually that goes well. I have I tend to have a really positive response in that first conversation. And then it's just all about figuring out, you know, the best um, sort of project project arrangement. But for me, that makes that means that I my um, you know, my sales process, right, from or the sales cycle, I guess you would say, from start to finish is slow because I have to reach out to them. Um, and I usually vet companies ahead of time. So I'm always the one reaching out first and doing all of that sales work. Um, oh, I guess I should say that now I'm in year four, right? And so companies do reach out to me now. But in the beginning, I reached out to them um, and I said, hey, I have this really cool thing that I'm doing. I'm a linguist. Let's talk about it. And if they said yes, that was a good sign. And then you just go for it and propose it and you get a lot of no's but you also get some yeses and all you need is a few yeses to start um and then all of a sudden something that nobody was talking about before right like linguistics for people analytics because becomes something that people are like oh yeah i heard about that or oh yeah you worked with uh so and so didn't you right um and so then it it sort of happens that way um but i will say it is a slow process and i don't have do any other kind of formal marketing at this point um mm -hmm. because i've been intentionally sort of growing it um a little more organically and as i've said i've, I've been home with my children part time um so i wanted it to um sort of happen naturally like as i was ready right to transition to more Got work it. Right. Sure. It'd be well, much harder I'm, if so, you had a really hot salesperson getting you lots of new business and uh, couldn't manage that. Yeah. I, I noticed Paulina has a question and I want to be able to take that and then I'll come back to Stephanie. Hi. Paulina. Uh, yes. Hi. Um, I actually wanted to ask what you were kind of describing, but so I would like to make a, like a deeper question of like, after you talk with them and then say like, okay, let's give it, do you give like a trial or like, how can you co fully convince them that your product is worth it? And at the same time, how do you convince people to work for you when you're just starting? Um, I know they would be in different process. You will not just try to collect everybody, like uh, have 100 employees at the same time that you just started. But I, I wonder how you start becoming, um, conscious also about like oh now I need to maybe hire people to help me this is something that you cannot just do alone thank you well I will let either Stephanie or Nina take the hiring question since I've never hired um but um I can say that after you know in terms of like when you're selling something one um I've learned um that you never want to give your services away for free um and as that's like the bad don't do that right so um no trials no free anything um you know you want to be genuine and in and as long as you're you're fair you know um i think that's sort of the key thing and the other thing is to have examples of previous work right so if you're able to say you know here's an example of a project i did um or you know testimonials from other clients that's all great um that helps convince the business to go for it um but i think one way to get around giving away things for free is to have some smaller scale project options. So for me, because what I'm doing is brand new and the company's never heard of it and they're like, oh, what's linguistics? And I don't really know if we want you to analyze our like internal company chat because that's, mm -hmm. you know, they have some, like there's just a hurdle to get over there. Um, you know, we can start with something really small, you know, maybe one team or one person, right? Or one meeting. Um, and um, not for free, right? But a small project that helps them say like, okay, we're curious about this. We wanna try. Um, we do have a budget for people analytics. Let's see what linguistics can bring to the table um, and sort of um, have that as part of your proposal process, right? It's sort of about scope and scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And, and the other thing I think that's convincing in addition to uh, samples, work samples, which are very, very convincing the other thing is to have a, a, a clear and convincing, rhetorically convincing proposal that isn't just full of adjectives, but makes, makes describes the process and helps the people that are, read, that are reading the proposal understand what they're going to get and how it's going to work and how it's going to play out. Because you know, it, it is less so nowadays in, in user research and interaction design, but you know, 20 years ago, hardly nobody knew what that was either. And we were having to go through exactly the process you described. Now it's much, much better known. But I would, so, um, so indeed, as the chat comment said, 
you were describing business development. And the other thing that I've always done is spoken at a lot of conferences because it's a combination of sort of paying forward whatever I've learned. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing it with, with other professionals and other people. And it also makes us visible. So we get, a, you know, we get a lot of inquiries as a result of that. But even then it's a funnel. And I mean, and this is probably a classic sales thing and I'm not a classic salesperson, but you know, I, I, I'd say I used to talk to a hundred people to get to write 10 proposals to get to do one project. Mm -hmm. And you know, the talking to a hundred people can be, it's, it's challenging, but if you don't talk to them, then they can't get to the next step. So you need to do that. Cool. Yeah, that's okay. really well said, Stephanie. Yeah, the developing that funnel takes a lot of conversations, but it does, mm -hmm. it gets easier over time, right? Like the, oh, yeah. the heavy lifting is, is in the beginning. And then um, once you get that funnel started, it starts to take off on its own. Um, yes, I mean, although, it, I mean, people cycle in and out. So you get you get a lot of refer. The more you do, the more referrals you get. But then people change jobs, and you have a recession. <laughs> all of a sudden, you have to you know you're not quite starting all over again. But but it's you know three steps forward and two steps back, and then three steps forward. Cyclic cycles, yeah. Yes, yeah. very much so. Ashley, uh, I see you have your hand raised. I assume that means you have a question. Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, I've appreciated hearing from everyone. And part of some of the confusion that I've run into with some business ideas is a bit of context and history on how what I'm trying to do has been done. So hearing from Stephanie and Nina, it, it sounds like you're more so saying that the, the, the services that linguists can provide have been being offered for quite some time but it's a matter of them finally being recognized. But then from Samantha, I'm, I'm kind of hearing that this is kind of something new and completely innovative. And I'm having a hard time finding where, where really the, the truth might be there or how I can better uh, approach companies in saying this is kind of how this has evolved over time and where I'm kind of picking it up. And it's being confused by the fact that there are, there are probably 10 different professions that overlap in different ways. I've seen some very good visuals about this, about how you know, content design and development, how that overlaps with user interface design, how it overlaps with information architecture, how it, how it overlaps with, with textual analysis. And there's bits of all of these different professions in what we're doing. So, Again, it's a, you know, we have a communication challenge to help solve our clients' communication challenges. I think, uh, in, in adding to, not, uh, I want to add something to what uh, Stephanie has just said. Samantha is providing a service which probably wasn't provided before in exactly this way to an audience that hadn't mm -hmm. been tapped before. So mm -hmm. Samantha's audience is the HR departments at companies that are big enough to have budgets for this kind of analytics. Whereas mm -hmm. Stephanie's customers are companies who are developing products that they need to make sure communicate between the developers and the end users. And so that's where she started, but she's still mm -hmm. in product side and not in mm -hmm. HR side. Yes. So different clients that you can attract that your business can attract depending on the mm -hmm. services you're providing. Mm -hmm. Does that and help? And we get an occasional, action? yeah. We get an occasional HR client, but mostly you're right. Mostly it's in product. Right. So it's the, it's- Or service. Or service. That, that linguists have been contributing to businesses and setting up businesses to help other people, but they've been doing it in a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So that, I'll, does that I'll help, that Ashley? On a, and to add to that too, um, Ashley, on a- I found that from a sort of textual analysis side, the, the product world um, has been 
is sort of ahead, right, of the company internal world, right? So if you're if you're looking at like pr products that are out there, to, um, you know, that you can sort of like purchase for textual analysis um, to do different things or like software products and things like that, um, those are sometimes like more advanced than what a company might consider like using internally um, for you know their own workforce. It's sort of like a um, I guess half of what I'm selling is sort of the idea that it's important to apply some of those same approaches right internally and then what the value of that is. So um, yeah, it, like Nancy said, the, the customer or the, the audience is, is different, you know, for the product side and the, the company internal side. And I didn't even address Nina there. So Nina, you, what size companies uh, or, or organizations come to you to get help with their website design? Um, we primarily um, did websites for small companies or single single users. Uh, I mean, you know, lawyers, dentists, that sort of thing. Um, we did originally, uh, when we first started, we were doing quite a few websites for groups at UCI. Uh, mm -hmm which was great, it was quite lucrative, um, but then things got a little easier to do and all the, and the UCI had a, our whole UC system had a big budget crunch. And so departments started using graduate students to do their websites for free. Uh, so all of that, well, I don't know if they were free, but, uh, <laughs> They didn't get paid anything like what we got paid. Right. Mm -hmm. And After I'm, I'm guessing also that uh, that was part of the evolution of universities realizing that they had to control the websites in some way so that they all looked like they come from the same organization. Mm -hmm. So there were higher level standards being put on people. Yeah, that was even later. Okay. That was, and, and there was the push to have them be websites that each so each department in the in the big group would have a website that looked similar, but they would be able to update it themselves. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm I'm not even I mean now it's all WordPress as far as I know. Uh, it's mm -hmm. interesting though. Uh, we have mostly TechEd has mostly commercial clients, but we actually have uh, a lot of uh, hospitals and a lot of universities. And it's mostly for user research so that the, the colleges, the you know, University of Michigan is one of them, but not alone by any means. And the colleges have people that, as, as Nina says, that are doing it themselves. But if they're perceptive, they recognize that they still need to uh, be informed by user data. And so they'll come out to us because they don't have staff or you know, they don't have staff for, 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 for research. Mm -hmm. So when you do research, what kinds of questions are you asking? Oh my, okay. <laughs> we're, uh, we're basically, observe well, it depends on what kind of research, but most, the majority of the research we do is observational. So it's kind of, it's kind of applied anthropology and we're, we're watching, we're observing people use whatever it is, whether it's the university website or uh, somebody's software product, or for that matter, a lawnmower. And we observe, we observe people and we see what kinds, of what kinds of problems they have using the product or service. And then we, we watch several of them, not just one, because people are different. There are a lot of what, individual differences. And then we go back to the client and, and we describe, and we, we basically tell stories. We describe the problems people had and, and often we'll then go on and say, you know, if you organize your menu this way, then people will find the things they're they're looking for right away instead of struggling. And that's of course a vastly oversimplified right. generalization. But I, I mean, I remember uh, working with back when they had standalone terminals, you know, dumb terminals. There was one that, that took half a dozen people to find out where the on off switch was. It was on the back of one of the legs. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, really? <laughs> and, uh, and there are a lot of, there are an amazing number of things like that out there still. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, there are, there are a lot of companies, I can, I can list them and you've probably heard of them too, who are saying, we need to make our, our products delightful. And 
I would love it if they were delightful, but I would love it even more if they wouldn't put all kinds of horrible barriers between the target audience and the product. So I'm all for delightful, but let's try to solve the, the, the usable first. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's my own hobby horse, I think, is, <laughs> is don't try to make this because don't try to make it fancy until you've made it work. Right, right. Ashley, I see your hand again, please. Uh, yes, thank you. I did want to say thank you. Uh, you were asking me if that did clarify. That really did answer my question very well. Okay. So thank you all. I did want to ask Alex also, um, Alex Johnson. I wasn't sure if you were still part of the panel uh, because Alex you had- in the room. She can talk. <laughs> Uh, you had introduced your uh, the company that you had and kind of what you were the services that you were providing beforehand, and I was curious how you approached or how the company that you were working with approached clients to do that type of work. Were you considered HR or a different part of the company? Thanks, Ashley. Uh, so when you're starting a company, I've, I've started my own company called Strategic Language Solutions, and I've worked with another boutique, meaning small, couple of two people to do work uh, with different clientele. And when you are so small, you do all of that work yourself and you are just uh, working your network. You're reaching out to people. You are connecting with people, telling them what you can do for them, what problems you can solve. And um, in our case, my case and with my other um, consulting work, we don't work with HR and larger companies. We find it uh, in our case to reach, it's more effective to reach out directly to, to managers and uh, people in C-suites who are decision makers and control budgets. So we focus on that level when we are uh, selling our products, which are curricula on presentation skills and relationship management skills and leadership development and intercultural communication. So, you know, there are, there are many ways to, to go about business development, but you can't get around just talking, talking, talking and meeting with as many people as possible to build up that network and to circulate what you can do. And thank you for defining that. Yeah, no, I, I, want, I was so glad that you said it because we are having the first linguist in the C-suite that I know is going to talk to us next week. Oh, there's, wow. There's a woman yeah. who's got a master's from MIT and did her undergraduate there too, who has become the C COO, Chief Operations Officer at, uh, for technology at Salesforce. And tech writing falls under her purview and she started out in tech writing. So here we have a lot of examples of tech writing and then moving on to other uh, directions within the same company or you know, to expand, to include that as well as other specialties. So thank you for introducing that term. I think I've used it already, but I wasn't clear that the audience knew that expression. Thank you. Uh, Paulina, tell us what's on your mind. Uh, Miss Stephanie, sorry, I have issue speaking to you in English. Um, you were talking about not, not like at the beginning, like trying not to keep it that fancy to be like uh, um, working detail, like in, like with the proposal, be very descriptive and give a very good job. So I was wondering, uh, particularly um, um, Ms. Nina and you, Stephanie, that have like a longer career, how has been um, um, your way to manage your money without asking specifically how like the amount but when you start you have a limited budget so how did you have managed to make it work for you to expand your business in a way that is profitable and then in a way that lets you um, move forward that's I would like to hear your stories yeah. I had two business partners and we all three were married to UCI professors who provided health insurance and had incomes. And I talked to a woman and when I was networking one time who told me the only way to be successful in a business was to really have to be successful. Um, so that, you know, it was your only source of income and you were gonna starve on the streets if you didn't make a big, deal of it. And we never did that. We never 
we never had to, and I don't think we really wanted to. I mean, we were doing it sort of, I wouldn't say it was a hobby, but, and we were perfectly happy to make money, but we didn't have to make money. And so since we were partners, basically we just took the same amount of money out that we made for each of us. And if we didn't make money, we didn't take money out of the company. It's not like having employees who have, you have to pay, uh, you know? So it's just different. So if you want to be successful, I, I recommend having to be successful. It's, it's a challenge. It was, it, it was, it is stressful because you, you hesitate a long time before deciding to hire someone because you need to try to see the stream of projects coming in, but people don't make up their, I mean, it's, it's sadly still rare for us to get, you know, a year long contract. Our, our average project is probably two to three months. So, and you can't predict how long people will take it to make up their minds. So you're talking, this is this hundred people to talk to and 10 proposals. So, okay, now you've got your 10 proposals and they're all out there and you have no, no idea when they're going to say yes or if or when they're going to say yes or no. So we, there were times that we'd have actually 15 or 20 proposals actually out and none of them had said yes or no yet. So it's still, you know, all these years later, I still go, if you're going to say no, please say it quickly. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's definitely stress there. It's easier in the sense of financial stress. It's easier if you have contractors than employees because you don't have to pay them when you don't have them. But on the other hand, if you're trying, to, one, if you're trying to do uh, professional development with your staff members. They need to be, they pretty much need to be staff members and send people to conferences and send them to courses and do continuing education for your employees. And two, if you need to be able to respond very quickly to people with rush projects, those, the, and then three, if you want your teams to, to be really embedded together and work really well together, all those things argue for employees. So it's a trade-off. And, and as I say, we segued from not never having a contractor to now probably having more contractors than employees. And I think, I think a balance is actually good. You know, if, if I were earlier in my career, I would still be uh, trying to maintain about an equal balance if I could. So that you're, you're tempering the risk. You're, you're not paying for all the employees to be, you know, the horses sitting in the stable eating hay, even when they're not racing or whatever. But, uh, but on the other hand, you have the continuity and you have, and you have the fact that you're doing continuing education with them. So you know what your people know and, and, and you see them increasing and improving their skills. I know, is that, does that help? I want to follow up on a different thread that we've been pulling on. And that is, more on this business development stuff, namely, are you uh, generally successful at getting a phase two project and a phase three project from the same mm -hmm. client? Um, me, all of us, yes. Any, I mean, anybody who wants to jump in. Ab first. Absolutely. I mean, if it weren't for that, it would be impossible. You know, yes, indeed. I mean, our, our, our best client, our, you know, our best projects are the second or third or fourth or 10th mm -hmm. project for a client. You know, there are some, there are some, some of our clients we've been working for, for, for more than 20 years now. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. So that means that at the end of your project, when you say, here's what we learned about this particular thing, here are our recommendations and mm -hmm. phase N should be, let's, let's check the following things that we didn't have a chance to do before. And yeah. when can we start on that? Right. And sometimes there's a big, we've got one, we do, we're working for one professional society in San Francisco where there'll be a gap of two years. We've been working for, with them for more than 10 years uh -huh. and we're not doing a project all the time because they need a year or so to digest what we one set of research that we've done. Mm. And so we're typically doing one research project every couple of years, but, but the continuity is there. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So that, again, is another, uh, you know, balancing act about employees versus mm -hmm. contractors. If you've already worked for the ACME Society, now some new staff member is going to come in who doesn't know the history. Is that an issue? And yes. Even though exactly. it's the same department. Right, right. Yes, yes, exactly. Now, yeah. having longtime contractors, as I do, helps that. Got it. That's why I'm able to do more with contractors now, because, you know, some of them have been with me a lot longer than many of our employees have been. Right. Anybody else have questions that you would like to address? Nina, do you have anything more to say about follow-on projects? We didn't have a whole lot of that. Uh, I mean, for some of my clients, I'm hosting their websites. Um, I, I rent a whole server in Michigan. Um, and so I, I not, and I just do, you know, little changes for free. You know, you move your office, I'll change the address on your website. And right. So it's sort of part of your hosting fee. Um, and I mean, I, I, I've always liked the hosting because it's making money while you sleep, whereas everything else was, you know, making money or not yeah. while you're struggling to get something done. Yeah. Um, Alex, did you have a question? Well, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, present another uh, kind of encouragement for people who are thinking about starting their own businesses and thinking about business development and how to get that first client with respect to follow on projects, because so often delivering that first product or service is that that test of how you mesh with that company, how you align with that company and the, the value that you deliver, you can put into place some metrics that will help you. You can always include feedback. You can always um, try to develop relationships with champions within that organization. This is why my organization targets the C-suite executives who have the budget decision-making and also manage teams who they want to develop. So we're in the talent development business and getting somebody on your side who can champion your work within an organization with that type of decision-making power can also can often lead to those follow-on projects. And in one or two you know, very successful cases, we managed to get on retainer with the company. Mm -hmm. which this is like the, the golden, you know, please. Exactly. Golden because that means that they're paying you uh, you know, a certain number <laughs> per, uh, every month to have you just at the ready to work with employees. So you get constant income um, that can kind of balance out juggling a portfolio of proposals that are out there and then coming in at various staggered timelines. So just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, thank you. That's a great model. And I had forgotten that, but I have, I know people who've gotten those kinds of relationships going in it. It's lovely and it may not last that long. I mean, the one example I'm thinking of is somebody who used to work for Stephanie, who's on her own, who was on her own at that point and came in uh, when the, the startup, well, not a startup, I shouldn't say that, this company had like transformed itself and said, oh, we, we're on this New York Stock Exchange. I guess we should have a customer experience department, which they'd never had. <laughs> You know, like the CEO was trying to master Photoshop to put the stuff together. Oh, it was crazy. Anyway, they were in, they were in business for 16 years and finally formed a customer experience group, which included a user experience group with a staff of more than one designer. And uh, so they hired this experienced user experience with professional to come in as the uh, UX manager was saying, well, how many designers should I hire before I get a research manager in here? How many, how do I get a writer in and when, when should mm -hmm. I time that? And so some of those decisions about when to do things, how to, how to write staff uh, descriptions that wouldn't overlap too much and um, things like that. So she was on retainer for probably I don't know, two years or something, which was great because they didn't even call on her for, you know, I think it was quarterly she was getting paid. And so mm -hmm. I said, when I got there and I know her and I said, okay, for this quarter, can I ask you to do the following task? Because I don't see anybody else calling on you. Can you demo how to do 
this methodology technique with our uh, our department staff. And so that I got to benefit from the fact she was already on retainer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's great. People are getting exposed to these ideas today, and I hope that they will have many more opportunities to meet more linguists. Among the people that uh, are we're yet to meet, that I'm just pulling out of the top of my head, who have run their own UX business or communications business or something, uh, Robin Battison, who's going to be on the program with me tomorrow morning. We're not talking about his business, although he could have easily been a member of this panel as well. And if you want to grab him at one of the mixers or just message him on Slack, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you about that. He was based in Sweden for a number of years, like 30 years, and was working then with a European audience largely, but occasionally other parts of the world as well. And had he had a long relationship with the Canadian uh, embassy or the Canadian business development people in Sweden. Um, uh, Dana Chisnell had her own business for a long time. Then she co-founded a nonprofit that I ended up working for for a while. And she's currently with the US Digital Service, but she could talk to that issue as well. Um, anyway, there's a, there's a bunch of other people who have either currently are or have run their own businesses as linguists in industry. They may not call themselves linguists because as we've heard from Samantha and others, linguistics is kind of esoteric. Uh, people don't know what linguistics is, are. Oh, how many? How many, you're, you're a linguist, how many? Right, that's the question. And, and at right, right away, you know how naive they are. So I think this is another issue is that we don't, we don't hide our linguistic skills and knowledge but we don't necessarily lead with it because it's not terminology that's familiar to the audience. Mm -hmm. Is that fair? Yeah. Although Samantha, I think, is, is doing a great job of educating her clients to ask for linguistic services. And yeah, I think it's a good balance um, to uh, introduce a like linguistics as a technical term with something that they are already familiar with because it does give you credibility. I mean, Linguistics and communication are, um, you know, can be described with the word communication, but linguistics is also more than that. And so it's important to say, you know, my skills here go beyond, um, you know, what you might associate with communication, right? Um, and that's an important value add that you bring as um, someone who's doing work for a, a client. Great. I noticed Aubrey has a question in the chat, so I, if Aubrey, you want to ask it or you want me to ask it? Either way. It's about data security in Samantha's yes, case, but maybe others have comments about that too. I do see the question. Um, so Aubrey asked, how do you handle the security concerns with analyzing user data? Um, yes. And so that is, that is a concern for some clients. Luckily, um, uh, when you're when I'm analyzing typically internal communications, um, you know, the, the data stays inside, you know, the company and it's only company internal data. So, you know, teams, um, I, I typically never analyze um, transcripts of meetings or, you know, things that involve any of like the, the client's clients, right? Or anything that would involve, you know, another um, third party. So there's sort of that like restriction um, and then it's sort of up to the company. I, I of course, have insurance as well. Uh, we were talking about insurance earlier in the um, uh, in the conversation. Um, but I think you know the way that we handle the security concerns is just with the level of um, the level of comfort of the client. Um, some clients want to include a lot of demographic data along with a um, with a language transcript because you can learn more. So for example, you know, Aubrey commented that, oh, I'm sure it's anonymized. Um, and actually, yes, no names, but sometimes it, it's not anonymous in any other way because they want to know. Um, you know. They need to include that demographic information in order to really understand how their teams are working together. I mean, if you have, um, what's a good example? Like the only woman on a team. Yes, exactly. Or just to um, take a random example, you know. Right. And you need to know, you know, the who basically uh, you know, that 
that that person is a woman, right? Um, and sometimes it, you know, the company does want to know who that woman is because um, if you, you know, or who that person is, um, because if you're analyzing the language, you know, and you want to use that data to improve business outcomes, and these are your employees, um, that can be important. And so as long as the data stays within the company, usually companies don't have a huge issue with it. But that's another reason why I typically don't analyze email. Everyone always asks me about email right away. They're like, oh, so email. So you analyze emails. And I'm like, actually not usually because emails are complicated and they go, there's a lot of external uses um, for emails, right? And you can filter for internal emails only. Um, but typically what we're trying to do is actually, you know, internal meetings, internal chats, things that are truly, you know, exclusively company internal to keep that secu data secure and private um, for the company. And, you know, most employees don't think about this, but, um, you know, your employer owns your chats and your meeting transcripts and actually your emails too, right? So, um, you know, even though it might feel like a violation of your privacy, um, that's something that your employer actually owns. And so they get to make the decisions about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, and how aware are the employees of your work? Yeah, you know, I actually haven't had, um, I haven't had a lot of employees or people, you know, who are sort of the, the team members, right, express concerns about privacy. Mm -hmm. Usually, the, like any privacy concerns are sort of addressed with the per person who's sort of doing the purchasing or the person that I'm like selling to. Um, and then once it's been done, sort of the sale, the teammates who are participating in the analysis or the language that's being analyzed, those individuals are usually just really excited about it because it's just something new, you know, and interesting. People love to learn about their own language patterns. Um, and it feels, you know, like something special that a company is doing to sort of, I don't know, like really, really, you know, take notice of how their team is performing. Excellent. So thank you all very much. I know that it, we're coming up to the hour mark and we have another talk that starts on the hour. So if anybody has some closing remarks they'd like to make, something that I didn't ask about or you didn't ask one another about, I'd uh, be happy to hear some of those. Look at that last question. That almost okay. that is, does, is a really nice wrap up question. Excellent. So let's talk about it. I'll try not to pull my headset out again. Hmm. So um, are there any, so the, I'm gonna read out the question from Andy. Uh, are there any recommendations of where to start when thinking about starting our own business, especially related to our linguistic skills? So send them off with some fabulous recommendations. I think, try, I think, think, I guess I would say, look for problems that you can address or solve. I was think about, think about what needs attention in the context of what you know how to do. Think of examples of experience, think of examples of experiences which are painful, which could be improved by applying linguistics related skills to them. And then I, th I, I feel like one has a better chance looking for a problem and saying you can solve it than building a better mousetrap because somebody might not want a better mousetrap. Nina, any closing thoughts? Well, I certainly wouldn't start a website company at this point. There are <laughs> so many and so much, uh, so much easier to do than when we started. So I, I don't know what to say uh, other than that. And I think you're a great example of uh, somebody who started a business to maintain your, you know, interest and livelihood, but it wasn't the primary source of your family's income. And, uh, and I think that's true for a number of businesses that they're not all interested in giant growth. So it may be that Samantha is going to turn into a whole industry because she's mm -hmm. tackling a problem that we hadn't even addressed before from a linguistic point of view. And I think Stephanie's shown an, a wonderful example of how the growth of your business might be organic because of the changing needs, the changes in technology and so on, so that you've grown and now you're coming down a little bit. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know whether anybody's gonna take up 
your mantle when you decide to retire or you know then you have a choice are you going to close the business yeah. or are you going to yeah. sell the business yeah. right yeah that's and, uh, those are indeed some of the upcoming questions right because it's such you know it's such a challenge that that most most people don't want most people don't want some to do something that hard right <laughs> <laughs> Right. So there you go. I like hard problems. What can I say? Great. Well, we certainly appreciate your spending some time with us today. And I'm hoping that uh, if students have, or the participants in our program have further questions, they can be in touch with you in the future. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm.